Good evening. Please turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians 3. And we'll start there at verse 1 in a little while. That's page 953. You are using a Bible that is provided. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1. So we've been talking about the last couple of weeks the outward and ordinary means that the Holy Spirit communicates to us the benefits of Christ's redemption. We've been talking about these means of grace, as we call them. Last week we looked at the Word, the Bible, God's Word. And, well, the last two weeks, really, how it's heard, how it's to be um, read, how it's to be received and taught. Now this week we'll begin looking at baptism and the Lord's Supper, or communion as we call it. And the question tonight, question 74, says, How do baptism and the Lord's Supper become spiritually helpful? Answer, baptism and the Lord's Supper become spiritually helpful, not from any virtue in them, or in him who does administer them, but only by the blessing of Christ and the working of the Spirit in those who by faith receive them. Quite a bit there, but we'll pull that apart uh, section by section. So, if you're there in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 1, please stand and we will read God's Word. But I, brothers, could not address you as a spiritual person, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you are not ready for it, and even now you are not ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted Apollos water, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for your faithfulness. God, that in the chaos and uncertainty of life, we can come to you. Lord, we can trust the solid rock of your word. Lord, you have given it to us. What a blessing it is. Your word is truth, and we ask that you would sanctify us by tr your truth. Make us holy by your truth. Lord, thank you for these catechism questions and answers that teach us that help us remember what your word says and how it applies to our lives. Holy Spirit, give us ears to hear tonight. Jesus, you are building your church and the gates of hell will not prevail. We ask this all in your holy name. Amen. You may be seated. So I'm not going to go into detail tonight about baptism or the Lord's Supper. In the coming weeks, we'll dig into those in more detail. But tonight will be more of the general kind of overview of how they are helpful in the Christian's life. So we see the first part of the answer says that baptism and the Lord's Supper become spiritually helpful. First, before we even get any further, we need to be reminded that they are spiritually helpful. They are not just simply things we do because, well, that's what people always did. We'll talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> it says, Baptism and the Lord's Supper become spiritually helpful not from any virtue in them or in him who does administer them. So it's not the actual water that you're baptized with. It's not the, the bread itself that is special bread or whatever's in the cup, whether it's grape juice or wine. Um, we have grape juice here at the River's Edge. The fruit of the vine, either way. Um, and we know every religion has rituals and traditions that's common to 
to all religions. However, Christianity has these two very distinct and unique rituals and traditions. And we want to remember that rituals and traditions are not bad in and of themselves. Um, and specifically within Christianity. Now, in another religion, that's a whole other topic, because the fact is that those are all false religions, and they're worshiping false gods. So all of those traditions and rituals are um, bad or sinful. But within Christianity, any ritual or tradition that is according to Scripture, specifically, but even other traditions that we maybe have gotten along the way that are not sinful but aren't exactly found in the Bible, um, they can be helpful, but they also can be sinful. It depends what we believe about them. And this has happened with baptism and the Lord's Supper. We can look back in church history and see gross misunderstandings of both and misapplications of both. And so, as I said, it's not the actual water itself of baptism, as it's called in the Roman Catholic Church, holy water. It's not the actual bread or fruit of the vine in the Lord's Supper. Nothing magical or mystical about those physical elements. What did 1 Corinthians 3, 7 say? We read it just a little bit ago. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. And so as far as the person administering Baptism or the Lord's Supper or the people because usually more than one person is doing those this right here it says really they're nothing God is the one who makes them count now God uses those people we'll talk about that and they are an integral part of it but no man is actually um, holy in and of himself 1 Peter 3.21 says, Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. There's a lot there. That's a very... Uh, complicated and interesting passage that many have disagreed about concerning baptism. I'm sure we'll get into it in the coming weeks. But it's actually pretty clear. I don't, you're not there right now, but if you want to write that down and look at it later, 1 Peter 3, 21 and 22. It says, Baptism now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body. So it's not talking about the water or the act of getting wet and dirt coming off of you. But as an appeal to God, so you're trusting God, you are looking to God to do something. As we just said, God makes the growth. God does something. For a good conscience, an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's only because of Christ. We're going to see that in a second part of the answer. That it's through Christ who has gone into heaven. He's at the right hand of God interceding for us. And that's very important because the Roman Catholic view concerning baptism and the Lord's Supper is that the Pope is called the Vicar of Christ, the representative of Christ on earth, this one man. And they have a whole um, explanation for this, saying that Peter was the first Pope and it's a, a succession through and they have it laid out very detailed. But it is not explicitly in Scripture. They take the passage where Jesus says, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. It's clear that um, the, the rock is Jesus' teaching. And yes, through Peter, who represents the apostles, the teaching of Christ will go forward. Peter himself is not the rock that they claim there he is the first pope. And we know that priests in the Old Testament, in the Mosaic Covenant, priests represented the people to God, 
And the people needed a priest. They needed the priest. They especially needed the high priest once a year to go before the Lord to atone for their sins. And sadly, that uh, bled over into Roman Catholicism. And I believe even Eastern Orthodox, but someone correct me on that, that the priest mediates between the people and God. Still. And that's not what the Bible teaches. Jesus is the one who mediates between man and God. <clears throat> and so, in the Roman Catholic tradition, that's why it is so important for them that the priest is the one who, him alone, prepares communion. And even in certain situations, he is the only one who takes it, and he takes it in place of the people as re representing them. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible says that we are all priests in the New Covenant. That's why we here call those who teach and preach pastors or elders, not priests, so that there isn't confusion with the way that the Roman Catholics have that set up. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And so that echoes what God said about Israel in the Old Covenant, but it's in a New Covenant context that we are all priests. It's been called the priesthood of all believers. And that was a huge aspect in the Protestant Reformation. We just celebrated it on October 31st, Reformation Day. Now that does not mean that it's a free-for-all and that, well, we all uh, have a direct connection to God through Christ, which is true. And so we don't need pastors, we don't need leaders. No, that's not true. And many are, unfortunately, uh, teaching that and have since the Reformation, but that is not at all what the Reformers intended. It's clear in Ephesians 4 that there are different gifts in the church and that pastors are needed, pastors and teachers. But they are not more holy than any other believer because we are all saints. We are all the holy ones through Christ. And so pastors are not needed to mediate between man and God only Christ. And so sometimes people will ask me or Pastor John to pray for them, and we love to pray for people. We'll never not pray for someone. But if they are asking us because they think that we have a better connection to God, which is sometimes the case, that's why they're asking us, then we try to help explain to them, you don't need me to pray for you. But we encourage them that you can pray to God yourself, and we would love to pray with you, and we will pray for you, but you don't need us. And so, yes, we all have different gifts, but we are all in Christ, if that person is a Christian. We've been talking about that a lot recently on Sundays, being in Christ. And so you don't need a special connection. You have the special con connection by the Holy Spirit through Christ. And so there are many gifts, different unique gifts, and we're all given those, or we're all given at least one gift. But even the apostles, and they were special. They, they could do things that, I, that we believe now um, we, we won't normally do, like certain miracles to, to authenticate our ministry. But even the apostles, although they could do these things, they knew that they were just men. They were not to be worshipped. People would try to bow down and worship them, and they would say, no, only Christ. And so even the apostles weren't needed to mediate between people and God. We see that in the book of Acts. You can read it. With that all said, this first part of the answer that it's, it's not the elements of communion, it's not the water of baptism, it's not the person, whether the pastors or elders or deacons who are administering these things, 
we do believe it's none of those things that that make baptism or the Lord's Supper spiritually helpful. But we do believe that the church officers, elders and deacons, should be the ones to distribute the elements and perform baptism. The 1689 London Baptist Confession of Faith, which we have adopted here at the River's Edge, says this, these holy appointments or ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper, these are to be administered by those who are qualified and called to administer them according to the commission of Christ. So, it's according to the commission of Christ. Well, what are they talking about? First, this commission was given to the 12 apostles. Well, the 11, really, in the Great Commission. But then the 12 were given, that was for baptism. And then the 12, even with Judas there, were given the, the command to do this in remembrance of me, with communion, right? So it was first given to the apostles, and then later the apostles went out, and especially Paul, but Peter as well. They appointed elders in different towns, elder, pastor, same word. So the office of elder and deacons, which deacon was another office, it's clear in scripture. The qualifications for those are in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, and it's important that each local fellowship had these two offices. Why? Because they represented the local body of believers that the person was being baptized into. Because when you get baptized, it's not just a personal thing. It is personal. It's representing your faith, your profession of faith. It's representing it publicly. But you're being baptized into the church. And so the local body of believers that you're being baptized into should have leaders and it just makes sense with the command and the commission given to the apostles who then appointed these leaders that they would be the ones who administered them. But once again, we need to be careful. We don't want you to think that you need a certain kind of person to do these things for them to work. As if Someone who doesn't have a, a pastor's license or something like that, or didn't go to school to be a pastor or something like that. If they serve you communion, then all of a sudden it doesn't mean anything. No, but it's pretty clear. The way it should be normally is that the elders and de or deacons administer these. And we'll see that in the second part of the answer. It's God who makes these things helpful, not the people doing it. We know there are exceptions, especially in missionary contexts where a church is being planted and believers have to be baptized. Um, and ideally, a, a pastor would be there, but maybe there isn't one there. And so a fellow Christian baptizing someone to help start the church, I mean, that's... That's good, right? That's how you start a church where there are no Christians. But that'd be the exception. And so baptism and the Lord's Supper are first and foremost to be taken in the context of a local church or to happen in the context of a local church. We see it in Acts. It says they, they, they believed and they were baptized and then they were added to the church. All right, could go on more about that, but we'll move on to the second part, which we kind of already talked about. So it says in the answer, baptism and the Lord's Supper become spiritually helpful, not from any virtue in them or in him who does administer them, but only by the blessing of Christ. Back to 1 Corinthians 3 that we read earlier. Paul said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. And so Jesus Christ is our great high priest. As I said over and over earlier, he is our connection to God. He is the mediator, the high priest that all the high priests of the Mosaic Covenant pointed to. You can read it in Hebrews 4 through chapter 8 pretty much. So we don't need any other human to intercede for us. First Timothy 2, 5, there's one God and there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ 
Jesus. So, baptism and the Lord's Supper are not man's ideas. The church did not make these up. Jesus Christ himself initiated them both, and thus he has blessed them. <clears throat> Another section of the London Confession of Faith says this, Baptism and the Lord's Supper are ordinances of positive and sovereign institution. They are appointed by the Lord Jesus, the only lawgiver, and are to be continued in his church to the end of the age. Jesus said at the Last Supper, Do this in remembrance of me. And in the Great Commission, he said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So he has blessed these ordinances. He's with us in them. He said he will never leave or forsake us. So how is he, how does he bless us in them? He's not here, right? He's at the right hand of the throne of God. So how does he do this? Well, the last part of the answer. Baptism and the Lord's Supper become spiritually helpful <clears throat> only by the blessing of Christ. And then the last part, in the working of the Spirit in those who by faith receive them. Later in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, Paul says, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. The unity that we have in the church with all believers throughout all ages is through the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus said in John 3, we must be born again, born of the Spirit. And so, it's because of the Holy Spirit that these are made helpful. So Christ blesses them. The Holy Spirit, who he sent, lives in us. It's the only way we're even saved. And makes these spiritually helpful for us. And we must perform them by faith. Romans 14, 23 says, Whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. And so we get baptized. We take communion by faith. Not with superstition. Not thinking the water is actually saving us. Not because it's a tradition and that's what the church has always done. Or because that's what my parents always did. No, we do these by faith. We receive them by faith, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to the scripture alone, for the glory of God alone. And so we don't have faith in the water of baptism. We don't even have faith in our willingness to be baptized and get dunked under water. We don't have faith in the bread or the cup. We don't have faith in in the pastor or whoever is baptizing us or serving us communion. We don't just trust our own understanding of God or our own understanding of the Bible and how these all work. How can these actually become spiritually helpful? I don't really fully understand it. It's by faith. And so it's not blind faith. God does bring us understanding by the Spirit. But it is by faith. True saving faith, which is a gift. Faith in what? Just faith. You hear people say that all the time. You gotta have faith. You know the song in the 90s? Faith in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Trusting in God's provision. These are historical facts. Jesus really lived, he really died, and he really rose again. So it's not blind faith. And then he gave us these beautiful ordinances. He blessed them so that we would remember and proclaim the gospel. So here it is. The Father sent the Son to accomplish salvation. The Son accomplished salvation. Of course he did. And then the Spirit applies it. So we have the, the Trinity at work in both of these. Baptism and the Lord's Supper display this reality. The gospel. And they display more as well. But that's the main thing they display. We can also talk about, as we will in the coming weeks, how they 
explain our communion with one another. As I said earlier, we're baptized into a local body of believers. We partake in the Lord's Supper, not by ourselves, but with other believers in the church. And so we'll go into those in more detail in the coming weeks. But I'll read the question if you'd read the answer with me and then we'll pray. Question 74, how do baptism and the Lord's Supper become spiritually helpful? Baptism and the Lord's Supper become spiritually helpful, not from any virtue in them, or in him who does administer them, but only by the blessing of Christ and the working of the Spirit in those who by faith receive them. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for these means of grace in which you build us up in the most holy faith, baptism, and the Lord's Supper. What beautiful ordinances they are that you have blessed Jesus and given to us. They have been observed since you ascended to the Father. Lord, thank you for your grace. We know they are not just symbols, that you are with us, Lord, that you make them spiritually helpful. They aren't just traditions that we've created, but something that you have commanded and that we have the privilege of partaking in. So Lord, help us remember how important they are. And I pray for all the young ones in here who have not been baptized yet, who have not partaken in the Lord's Supper, that you would help them as they begin to understand these things, Lord, that if they have not called out to you in faith and repentance and have been saved and born again, that you would do that in their young hearts and minds this moment, Lord, and that you would help their parents to guide them, Lord, toward these things that you have commanded us to do by faith. Help us, God, to be faithful as we do this. For your glory alone we pray in Jesus' name. like that term that we use when it comes to these uh, ordinances, baptism and communion, a means of grace. By grace we're saved. Uh, that no man should boast, saved by faith. The means of grace, his grace is sufficient for me. The fact that Christ blesses this means of grace to us the Holy Spirit applies this means of grace to us is very encouraging. Thanks, brother, for teaching us. These are two of the main commands Jesus gave us. Teaching you to obey everything that I have commanded. And lo, I will be with you till the end of the age. Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. But we were forgetters, and we talk about this often. These are things, these are remembrances. These are the... Uh, monumental moments in our lives when we get baptized, times of remembrance uh, that we're sinners and he's the Savior. Um, don't forget these things, and thank you, Ryan, very much. So, how many of you are dealing with a little bit of discouragement tonight? Yeah. I think, I think we all are. I know that I am for varied reasons. Uh, Got some heavy things on my mind. Um, and we just need to pray. The Bible says this. So I want to give you some. Will you turn with me to Psalm quick? And I'm going to make it quick because I know you've just taken in some important teaching this evening. But I want to bless you with the Word of God at a time of deep discouragement. I know some of you are tired, but you might be even more tired tomorrow. <laughs> uh, we've only just begun. We've got a brand new nation on our hands. And it is my view, in my opinion, that we've had an unprecedented, um, unprecedented coup take place. I'm just going to say it. I don't care. Uh, what's happened here is that um, the will of the people has been stolen. And um, I'm not into this, he said, she said, 
if you don't pay close enough attention, there's nothing I can do for you. Um, if you're not a political person, then you don't know what happened to you today. But you will know what happened to you today if things continue to go in the direction that they are. But the Bible tells us. I mean, I'm upset about it. I'm disappointed about it. Don't, don't get me wrong there. That's true. But the Bible gives us commands in this very comforting uh, passage of Scripture. Psalm 37, verse 1. Fret not. Underline that. Number one, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers that would follow. You would envy the person, it seems to be, or everything's going their way, right? For they will soon fade like grass and wither like the green herb. Understand their situation, how temporary it is in the, in the big picture. Verse 3, trust in the Lord and do good. Do good. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light, your justice as the noonday. There's been injustice take place. We've witnessed it in our own family today, in this state. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Not an election, for Him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in His way. Don't be jealous of Him, don't envy Him over the man who carries out evil devices. Wishing you could be the one to do what he's doing. Refrain, look at, refrain from anger. Are we Christians? Forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. So first, verse 1, fret not. Second thing. And, and by the way, what does the Bible say in Philippians ch chapter 4? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say it. Rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to all. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Do not be anxious. So we're told, secondly, to, to first not to fret, and secondly, now not to envy their temporary happiness. That's a dumb thing to do. And the third thing we're asked to do is to trust God. Do we trust Him? Has anything changed? Has God changed? He's still on the throne. He's still in charge. And he just might make it difficult for you and me and living in this land. This might be more difficult. Might be paying more taxes. We might be, uh, you know, living in a, a more impoverished situation. And we might be seeing homosexuals marry and a lot more abortions and all sorts of things that we think are evil. And then it says, do good. Is there anything you can do today before the evening is over to do good? God, in the anxiety of the elections last night, the Lord blessed us with some things. We had a bunch of food, and we just got in the car and started giving food away to people. And bless them. What can you do tonight? How can you do good? Do good. Make yourself busy doing good. Dwell in the land. Get, get busy doing what you normally would do. Get on with it. Have babies. Do whatever it takes to be you know, be, friend, be faithful to the things that, that you're going to do. Delight yourself in the Lord now. We've got a crazy thing going on here in our nation, but delight, enjoy God. And, uh, do you enjoy God? Delight in Him. Spend time with Him. 
that'll change your demeanor right away. And he'll give you the desires of your heart. He'll give you the will to want to do the things he wants you to do. I like that. You know, you delight yourself in God. You enjoy God. Uh, pretty soon you're enjoying the things that he wants done. Pretty soon your will becomes his will. Not my will, but thy will be done, Jesus prayed. Jesus taught us to pray uh, that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, then he says, commit your way to the Lord. What are you doing? Is what you're doing a God thing, a thing that God wants done? What are you busy with? Before you get started with it, commit it to the Lord. Make it a God thing. Make it a godly thing. That God would be glorified in it. We could talk more about these things. Be still before the Lord. Maybe turn off the TV right now. Because there's just fighting going on there. On this stuff. That's going to be taking quite some time. We have a president that is trying to do the right thing. And uphold the will of the people. And get rid of these false ballots. And all these things that have been showing up randomly and magically uh, out of nowhere, out of thin air. Uh, be still then, wait patiently for him. Dread not yourself over the one who prospers in his way. Just turn off the TV if that's what it takes. And then finally, refrain from anger. Forsake wrath. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. The Christian shouldn't be angry. It's hard not to get angry, but we've got to not be angry. All right? Christian has to act like God's child, like we trust him. Because we do, don't we? All right? And so at the end of the day, Jesus is Lord. We don't, our allegiance doesn't change to anybody. <coughs> it doesn't change from Donald Trump to Joe Biden because they're not our Lord. Never were our Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is in charge. Uh, we elect Jesus. <laughs> All right? And if you want to get theologically correct, he elected us. Isn't that wonderful? He elected us. So let's just relax and chill out in his presence and, and, and trust him, even though none of this went the way it should go. And you know what? There's virtually nobody either on the right or left of this political mess that's happy today. Nobody's happy. The left didn't get what they want, and the right didn't get what they want, nobody's happy. But we got what we want, salvation of Jesus Christ, who is Lord, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, help us make sense of these things in our emotions. Lord, help us to not you know, uh, be angry and sin and try and wreak vengeance on people and that sort of thing. Lord, let us not go challenge people and get in fights with them and argue with them. And Lord, let us uh, bear up under our governor who's going to see this as a, uh, an empowerment thing to shut more restaurants down and ask for addresses and numbers and so on. Uh, God, help us to be patient and kind and loving and Christ-like in Jesus' precious name. Amen.